welcome to Things Are Getting Strange, an X-Files Rewatch podcast. I'm Nick. And I'm Kim. And let's give an update from Filefest, or do we? Uh, yeah, I do have a bit of a one, and it's something I really should have mentioned earlier because I'm cutting it a bit fine for you all. There is a contest, mainly for people who are actually attending Filefest. It's a video contest. If you want to read all the rules, go to their Twitter, which is at Filefest underscore MSP. You have a chance to win a full script, uh, original script for an X-Files episode, which then if you're attending the event, any of the guests there will sign it for you. Do you get to choose or is it there's they've got a specific one in mind? Uh, they haven't specifically said on the Twitter, so I don't know. You could be walking away with your Tesos Despichos script, which actually might be awesome. Or your Fight Club script. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't actually mentioned the full details in a while, so if you are interested in attending, Filefest is a convention that's taking part in September, uh, the 8th to the 10th of September to be precise, in the Mall of America in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's all for the X-Files 30th anniversary, so they've got a huge guest list. I have reeled them all from previous episodes, I'm not going to do so again, but to give some choice ones, you've got Chris Carter, all three of the lone gunmen, William B. Davis, that's a cigarette smoking man, Annabeth Gish, who plays Reyes, and Nicholas Lee, who plays Kryzik, to name a few. Cool. So, plenty for you to go and see if you're attending. I'm still sad we're not. I know. You st- anyone who wants to can still pay for to go. We will take flights and accommodation and the entrance fees. And, oh, some, some amount of spending money would be nice too. Anyone? No? Okay. As long as they can arrange for me to see Stephen Williams, I'm happy. That's fair. But I suppose in the absence of a um, benefactor suddenly giving us a lot of money, we'll have to get to some episodes. Yeah. So, first up this week, we have Hell Money. Directed by Tucker Gates, written by Jeff Lamming, and first broadcast on the 29th of March, 1996. Guest stars. There's um, an appreciable overlap between these people. Okay. Like they, it's one of these... Yeah, I can see why it's happened, but it's not great because it's kind of like you've jammed all the people of the same ethnicity into the same few projects. I see, I see. So first up, we have B.D. Wong, who plays Detective Glenn Chow. Who was in Karate Kid Part 2? Father of the Bride, Parts 1 and 2. So I think he's the fiancé, though it's been so many years, I can't remember. He's obviously been in Jurassic Park and all three Jurassic Worlds as Henry Wu. He was in uh, Mulan 1 and Mulan 2. And Kingdom Hearts 1 and Kingdom Hearts 2 are playing the same character. Oh, who does he play? He played Li Shang, Captain Li Shang. Oh, the love interest. The love interest. He'll make a man out of you. Yeah, that's B.D. Wong. That's awesome. He was also, and we completely missed this one, in American Horror Story Apocalypse. Was he? He was, apparently. I don't remember him being in it at all. No, it must must be a very minor role somewhere. Well, if I need an excuse to rewatch it. (laughs) That's fair. I, mean, I think if you watch Coven first, maybe the first series of American Horror Story, but then... Yeah. Oh no, Apocalypse is one of the best. I know, but it leads into the first series and Coven. True, true. But also, there is pre-famed Lucy Liu, who plays Kim Sin. X-Files was not her first role, but she was, uh, she's been in a few things to note before she hit it famous, like Jerry Maguire and Payback, the Mel Gibson revenge film. She was also in Shanghai Noon in the same year as Charlie's Angels, and then she's in Charlie's Angels 2. She is in Chicago. She was in Kill Bill 1 and 2. She was in Mulan 2. Oh, right. Kung Fu Panda, Shazam Fear of the Gods, as we saw very recently. Hercules. Uh, one of her most famous ones, though, is Ali McBeal, where she played a recurring uh, character. Yeah. Uh, she's been in Futurama and The Simpsons, and also regular role as Joan Watson in Elementary. Oh, okay. But the probably the biggest actor they got in this episode is, of course, James Hong, who's been in, oh my god. Everything. <laughs> Everything. He's credited, though I know the novel gives you an actual name for him, as the hard-faced man. Uh, in the novel, he's called Mr. Yip. One of his first roles was in Godzilla King of the Monsters, as a, a voice. Oh, okay. But he's also been in Chinatown. He's in Airplane. He is, in fact, the guy who commits Harry Carey on the plane. Oh, yeah. He was in Blade Runner, Big Trouble in Little China, Wayne's World 2. Tank Girl, Mulan, Kung Fu Panda, Turning Red, Everything Everywhere All at Once. He was in an episode of The Outer Limits. He was, of course, in Seinfeld as the maitre d' of the Chinese restaurant. Yeah. 
He's been, he will turn up in Millennium. He's in Avatar The Last Airbender. He's also in Elementary. He's a voice in Diablo 3. And he was in Prey. Oh, neat. So to do things a little bit differently this week, would you like to give us a summary of Hellmoney? Hmm, I wonder why you're letting me go first this week. Quite mysterious. You offered. You offered. (laughs) Okay, our setting this time is San Francisco's Chinatown. We see a Chinese immigrant named Johnny Lowe making his way to his apartment during a festival of some kind. He is confronted there by someone who tells him to pay the price and is overtaken by three figures, all of which wear Xigong masks. Later, at a crematorium, the security guard finds the same three figures lurking near an oven. He sees that Lowe is trapped inside, being burnt alive. Mulder and Scully investigate Lowe's death, which is the latest in quite a long series of fatal incinerations in Chinatown. Mulder believes that ghost activity is behind the deaths, whereas Scully suspects it's all a cult that is responsible. When Mulder finds a Chinese character scratched apparently by the deceased inside the crematorium oven, he collaborates with Glenn Chow, who is a Chinese-American detective with the San Francisco Police Department. Chow tells him that the character means ghost or guai. Mulder also finds what looks like the corner of a bit of paper money within the ashes in the crematorium oven. Chow tells him that this is hell money, which is a symbolic offering to the deceased spirits, which is connected with what they call the Festival of the Hungry Ghosts, conveniently the festival that we saw the previous night. The agents manage to identify Lo and find his apartment. Inside, they find a collection of different Chinese herbal medicines, as well as protection charms. They also notice that the carpet has recently been replaced and find bloodstains underneath it. Interspersed for this, we cut to another Chinese immigrant, Sin. He is tending to his daughter Kim, who unfortunately has leukemia. He doesn't have the money to pay for her treatments and her outlook is not looking so good. We see Sin attend a kind of underground lottery where he has the potential to win a vast sum of money. It all depends on tiles drawn from a pair of vases, one of which contains the names of all the people taking part. The other has red or gold tiles, the gold ones being the lottery victories, the red ones being what we see very quickly as being the bad thing. A man's name is drawn from the lottery, but he then selects one of the bad red tiles. The following day, his body is found buried within an open grave in the local cemetery. Scully performs an autopsy on him and finds his body is absolutely crisscrossed with numerous surgical scars, which only look to have been from the last year. As they continue to investigate him, they also find a live frog has been stitched within his chest where his heart, amongst a few other organs, are missing. Mulder and Scully question Chow because they don't think he's been terribly helpful so far on the case. Chow tells them that the local community may maintain a code of silence, and being American-born, they won't reveal anything to him because they also view him as an outsider. Chow does eventually give them information that leads them to sin. Previously, we have had another scene at the lottery in which Sin was the unfortunate one who drew a red tile. When Mulder and Scully reach his apartment, we find he has a bandage over one eye and we've got to assume that his eye is missing. Sin does not give them any useful information, kind of maintaining this idea of the code of silence, though we do see that Kim listens in on the conversation. Chow later returns home to find the three masked figures from the opening sequence. Later, we learn that he has been attacked and he's in hospital, but when Mulder and Scully attempt to visit him, they find that he's disappeared. Meanwhile, Sin is visited in his home by the hard-faced man, or Mr. Yip, as he is called in the novel. He, we have previously seen, is the surgeon involved in this black market organ trade. Sin tells the hard-faced man that he wants to end his participation, to which the man reminds him that he knew the rules before he started, the rules can't be broken, and that the ghostly fires of the underworld will consume him if he leaves the lottery. Mulder and Scully manage to tight match the blood in Lowe's apartment with Chow, and thus begin to believe that he knew a lot more about the lottery than he let on. They try to visit Sin again, but only find Kim in his apartment. Kim does, however, provide them with a bit more information, because she did overhear the conversation with the hard-faced man earlier, and has begun to suspect that her father is in over his head and is in danger. 
Meanwhile, Sin has returned to the lottery. By sheer dumb coincidence or fixing, his name has been drawn again, and this time he has drawn the tile that represents the heart. As Sin is taken away for his surgery, Chow comes in and tries to persuade the game organisers to let him live, for Kim's sake, because she'll die without her father. It doesn't work, and Chow instead knocks over the table with the vases in a rage. This reveals that there are no winning tiles, the lottery has been a fix the whole time. Chow then storms into the room where the surgery is underway, and fires his gun at the hard-faced man. Mulder and Scully rush in and arrest them all, including Chow for his involvement in the lottery. Luckily, they are in time to save Sin's life. Afterwards, Scully interrogates the hard-faced man who has no remorse for what he has done. However, she learns that it's likely he will walk free because no one who participated in the lottery will testify against him. The Code of Silence maintains. We do get a bit of happy news, though. Not only is Sin going to get better, but his daughter has also now been placed on the organ donor register. However, Chow has mysteriously disappeared once again. In the last minutes of the episode, he awakes inside a crematorium oven and is burnt alive. Ooh, nasty. <laughs> That's one way of putting it. Well, it's, it's a real horrible way to go. We could start with, there's a troubling trend of the X-Files and its attitude to other cultures at the moment, so we've had a succession of them recently. Yeah, I do feel it's a problem that probably started with shapes. Yeah, right back in season one, but season three actually feels really bad for it because we've had Japan, Hong Kong, and now China as a whole just... And in the previous season we had Haiti you in Fresh Haiti, Bones yeah. in a similar way, and every plot, like the Blessing Way and shapes that are focused on Native Americans. Yeah. You don't get them going to France and doing this kind of thing. No, or <laughs> anywhere else. But it's the idea of alien cultures more so, is that all these kind of cultures that are not white American and their spooky, mystical ways that they will believe over science and that sort of thing. You know, the cultures that the X-Files want us to believe that are completely ruled by the supernatural. Yeah, and not that it's a tradition that they just keep on doing they're well aware that this doesn't have much bearing on the real world it's just a thing they do as celebration thing to be fair the festival of the hungry ghost is slightly more sinister than some of the other ones like um uh are similar ones in other cultures so let's say the day of the dead or oban the hungry ghosts themselves are inherently a bit creepier and a bit nasty you don't want them in your home it's not like these other ones where we're welcoming back the honored dead but there's more of a belief in it yeah you know it is the deep-seated belief that this is the time that our ancestors are returning. But we're not going to let that interfere with how we do our day-to-day -day life or anything. I'm also not sure, because I don't know much about Chinese culture, how accurate that festival is being portrayed, because I know our London Chinatown has a lion dance like that one we saw at the start of the episode at their Lunar New Year. So not sure if this is actually something they also do for the Hungry Ghost Festival. If anyone does know, I'd be curious, actually, to find out. There's... Uh, and you found the novelization didn't fall prey to this. There's an annoying hiding of information in this episode where a lot, a lot of the dialogue is in Chinese, which is fine. I'm not sure if it's Cantonese or it is Mandarin. It could be either. Um, the production notes infer it's, that they're speaking with Cantonese accents, so I'm assuming they're speaking oh, okay. Cantonese so as well. So presumably it's Cantonese. But we get subtitles for some bits of the episode and not others, and it feels that feels like kind of a shady way to operate. I wonder if it's because... That opening bit, at least according to the novel, is they're saying similar things to what Sin says to the hardest to face man later of the I want out, well tough, you can't have out, you knew the rules. Yeah. But it, <laughs> maybe they felt that that gave away too much if you put the subtitle on. True, but when you're watching it, you're kind of thinking, is the episode broken? Especially if you're watching it on any kind of disc medium or you're watching it not on broadcast TV. Yeah, I know I said to you when we started, did you remember to put the subtitles on? But apparently there just aren't in that yeah, opening sequence. No, they're, they're, if there's meant to be subtitles, you can't avoid the subtitles. But this one, they just don't have them. Ultimately, it's a weird episode. I mean, we can also get on uh, Chris Carter's inspiration for this episode, which is, I don't know, it's kind of an interesting idea, but I think tying it to Chinese culture like this gives a bad vibe to it. Organ harvesting pyramid scheme. Yeah, it's not really a pyramid scheme, is it? 
Well, it was just his original idea. Yeah. We've mentioned before he had the notice board where he wrote up one sentence ideas. Yeah. I was also thinking while you're doing your summary is it's a cre- creepy thing when they discovered the dead frog in the guy's chest. Life frog. Life frog. Sorry, life frog in the guy's chest. I was thinking that when you were reading the summary, it's a case of, but why did they do that? I guess it's feeding on the bit earlier where she finds the dried frog in Lowe's apartment. And I think Wong explains that they're kept for protection. It seems ironic that you'd have a protection thing in an empty cavity where you'd <laughs> nick someone's heart. Yeah. The, and also, it's a live frog and you've buried him underneath a open grave by those three people who just hang around. I don't believe there's supposed to be anything supernatural in this episode. I think they are the enforcers of this Chinese mafia. Yeah. But all I can think of is they're supposed to represent... Wong re- mentions the Prita at one point, which is, I'm again, I'm not sure how rooted this is in actual Chinese mythology, but Wong says in the episode, they're the worst kind of ghosts, like the ghosts of murder. As, um, yeah. The idea of, I think it works on the Buddhism idea of when you die, you're reincarnated into different realms, depending on how good you've been. Okay. So the hungry ghosts are particularly low down because these tend to be in legends like somebody who's been greedy or withheld things from other people, like withheld food from the poor or something in life. So you're kind of reborn into this like more hellish realm where you're always going to be hungry as your punishment. Whereas, you know, the Buddhist goal is to be reborn higher and eventually achieve enlightenment and break the cycle. So Wong kind of elaborates the fact that the ghosts that are the most fearful are the Preta which are these ghosts of people who have been murderers before, so they're really nasty now and come back nasty. So all I could think of in the episode is with the ma- the Shigong masks on, they're supposed to be scaring these really superstitious people into thinking this is the Preta coming for them. I can see that. It doesn't work for the guy at the graveyard, though, who is a white Or the guy at guy. the crematorium. Yeah, so... Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I can understand it spooking other people. Not so much Detective Chow when they do it to him, because he knows who they are, presumably. It seems you've really got to buy in on a cultural level, and I'm not sure how much I do buy in, is the fact that people are kept in line so much by these superstitions. So many people kept in line. This isn't just a small minority. No, it's like... This is like the entirety of Chinatown. (laughs) Yeah, and everyone involved in the lottery is too scared to speak out about it. Because even when Sin tries to leave, the hard-faced man comes and says, oh, you're going to be dragged to hell if you don't, and that gets him straight back in. You can understand the love of the money initially, but the second, his first opportunity he got, he lost an eye as a result of it. And he knows that's probably the best outcome of that lottery, or one of the better ones, because I think his liver was one of the others, wasn't it? You don't see all of the tiles, though it's extrapolating the episode. Each one has a Chinese character on it that represents an element, and these elements are also linked to certain body parts. Yeah. So I think it's the symbol for wood is the symbol for eye. Yeah. And fire is heart. I think so. But they're the only two you see in the episode, though it's made clear that the man whose name I never caught, actually, who they find in the grave, he'd lost, I think, a kidney, a cornea, and a bit of liver before his heart, or something like that. It's about that, yeah. No, there are two things coming off of that, one of which is it was exceptionally hard to catch most of the names in this episode. That They are extremely rarely spoken. I've got to admit, I got a lot of them from the book, because in the book even, the three officials that do the lottery have names, and they barely speak in the episode. Yeah. The other point was, we know they're cheating in this game, and there's a few ways they can do it. It's not actually clear how they managed to substitute the winning tile out because while you see sin whenever he draws a tile he always clutches it tight till they pull out of his hand and that's an ample opportunity to do the bait and switch Mm. the first guy we see do it doesn't do that does he because he opens his hand first and then they grab it so he see what tile he's got we also see the bit with wong at the end when he overturns the table is all the tiles are red anyway yeah and are they all the same symbol uh, yes, I believe they were. They're all the heart tile that day. Yeah. So what I'm leading up to on this is they're not very efficient gang, really, because for Sin, presumably they've also rigged the name choice mm. for this. So logically, being a criminal gang doing this, you'd go through 
all the non-essential body parts before you moved on to the eyes, and you do the heart last. I'm going to assume from Singh's perspective and the fact that the previous guy had had at least four surgeries before yeah. they took his heart, is it's purely because they're worried that Sin's going to bolt? I imagine so. It just feels one of those overdramatic things of, you didn't actually have to hold lottery. Mm. You could have just abducted him. I mean, and again, that's one of the bits where I can see the hard-faced man's logic at the end of it, of, you know, a life without hope isn't worth living. And he truly believes he's giving these people something to aspire to, even though he knows it's futile, because they're just going to prey upon them and take what they want. At the same time, they didn't actually need to hold the lottery because surely they could just send the three ghosts to abduct whoever they wanted to and just dispense with that as well. Especially when you've got people so superstitious. As you say, if they just came for sin in the night, all the hard-faced man would apparently have to say is he was a bad person and the Preta came for him. Yeah. I mean, again, it's the problem of your premise, is, your premise should be fine, but... If it's if it's not supernatural and it is just a criminal enterprise, they're doing strange things. Mm. If this was an actual supernatural thing, like I don't know, faith healing or the um, uh, whatever that trick is, we you know where you do the surgery without actually cutting into someone. Psychic surgery. Yeah, if it was that kind of thing, I could see why you've got this elaborate setup for it, but not for you're just using these people to harvest organs. And then we also have that. The woman who is in the clinic who's been doing all the health checks for the all the Asian men who've come to her. And there's loads of them. They say they come in for a checkup and they never come back. And she never thought to say, this is a bit weird. Oh, I should have mentioned that previously. But yeah, that is the clue that actually sends them after Wong in the end. Is they go and speak to a woman at the health clinic. And she says, oh, I know what this is about. It's about all those Asian men that came in here, had their kidneys measured, and then disappeared when we called them saying we'd found a match. It's like, why did you not report this? This, this, is, this is a widespread thing, a very weird... <laughs> ah! It should also be noticed that the fear in this episode is scary, but it plays off the kidney heist myth. Yeah. Which is a really famous urban legend about you going out drinking and waking up in a bathtub full of ice, basically. Like in Urban Legends 2 or 3 did it, didn't it? Yeah, one of the sequels definitely did. But it's not actually... Well, one, it's never been proven. And two, it's really unviable because the life... The lifespan of harvested organs is a lot shorter than you would imagine. They basically have to be put into someone else very, very quickly afterwards. They can't be kept on ice very long. So when Mulder finds that fridge full of human eyes and various <laughs> other things, is they would no longer be viable by this stage. No. And there goes all the money that they're presumably getting from this illegal black market um, organ trafficking. Mm. So, <laughs> yeah. I don't get it. It's obvious they're rigging, again, it's obviously rigging the game, but it's not clear how they're rigging the game. Because as uh, some either some very subtle sleight of hand they're doing, or I don't know, it's just there's not no clear way of them to do it unless that was actually the ghosts who are substituting things out. I'm also baffled about how no one's questioned it for so long, despite the fact no one's winning this lottery. Yeah, the book specifies, and it just does so in the narrative. I don't think they actually say it in the episode that the hard-faced man is supposed to be the person who won the lottery. I think he does. He does actually say that in his meeting with Sin. He does say, I'm one of the winners. Yeah. This, you, it is, you, I'm proof that this is possible to win. But we don't see any other evidence of that. We see no other winners. We only see people lose through the course of the episode time and time again. Yeah, you'd think, to keep this going, you'd have ringers in the um, audience. Yeah. You'd have someone else who can sort of win it and everything. And then, okay, you need a few months to build up to that kind of pot, prize pot again, but it will eventually get there. Yeah. You know, have someone win, have someone win early, and so like, you know, oh, you've won a hundred dollars or something, and be really disappointed. Yeah, it's just one of those kind of subterfuges that you can't keep com going for that long. Yeah, and Detective Chow, as the corrupt policeman, feels really awkward because I know Mulder and Scully sort of go halfway through, or oh, you're not being much help. He doesn't give that impression at first, does he? He actually seems to be... He, he feels like he get the guest third partner of the X-Files for the week with how he's tagging along with them. 
I did read a criticism of this episode that said it feels like the pilot for B.D. Wong's spin-off detective series. Yeah, a shame he got killed at the end, but I can see that. And it's actually kind of weird when they sort of say, you're not being much help at all. It's because he took you around to all the Chinese herbal places, said there's only a few places you could possibly buy helm and I'll take you to them. This person knows the Chinese medicine we found in this guy's apartment. And then, rather abruptly, they go to Sin's apartment and they have that conversation. And it turns out, oh, yeah, he called in the carpet change over at the first victim's house. Like, do you not have someone else in the mod that can do this for you? Good point, good point. To, to not implicate your inside source, who presumably is why this has gone on for so long. Because I suppose that's the other problem. The episode is very fixated on super, superstition keeping everyone quiet. You have a literal person in the San Francisco Police Department who should be able to intervene and intercept what's coming in. So you don't need the culture of fear as well? Or it's really odd you've got both? And, I don't know, Detective Chow just, it feels like it's a, a twist in want of something else. I feel that the fear of the mob would be enough on its own, like you say, is China has its own mafia, it has the triad. So this could just be a triad enforcing this sort of... Yeah, we don't, we don't need ghosts for this. Okay, so if this is a chance to win money, you will have to gamble your organs. We insist it's all above board. Look, here are the previous winners. Oh, too bad you lost this week. You'll have to give us your eye, your kidney, etc, etc. And if you try and run, the hitman over there will get you. Yeah. So <laughs> the supernatural flavouring is redundant and... Be- well, I suspect the supernatural flavour is purely there because this is the X-Files, and if you didn't have it, people would say, what are you even doing? I think that idea is what made me think watching it is, it doesn't feel like an X-Files plot at all. You've got these kind of vague supernatural trappings that we quickly realise are not actually supernatural. But I've seen weirder episodes of CSI. This would just fit into any other crime procedural. Yes. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can imagine an episode of CSI and NCIS or whatever with the whole, oh, this is all about the hungry ghost phenomenon in Chinatown. And just... You could even hinge on the fact of, there's this weird thing with a ghostly figure in a mask. Oh no, it's not a ghost, it's actually the triad. <laughs> you know, it, it would just follow the kind of pattern of a CSI episode. Yeah. The contrary point, though, I was thinking as well, is, again, in contrast to Tesla's suspicions, there's a decent amount of actual detective work going on. They are following leads... It's like, who did that carpet replacement? Where would we get this medicine from? Although I'd have thought, where would you get the medicine from in Chinatown? There's got to be a load of different places that will stock this. And the Helmony, I don't understand why the Helmony was so precise as well. I don't understand how it wasn't burnt up. Yeah, in the crematorium. Well, actually, I think they dropped that as a clue because they sort of say, oh, this is Helmony, it's worthless. Where would sell this? Oh, not many places I can find out. But then they don't ask about the hell money. They only ask about the um, medicine. I guess it's so you can have that kind of double entendre for the title of the literal hell money and the concept of dirty money for the lottery. Yeah, but it's actually irrelevant to the episode, basically. Oh, it's... it's. I don't know if it's one where it feels like you need another draft. I think it's that you, you're kind of nearer to the start of this developed as a plot. You need to go through a whole load of more variations. And possibly scrap it all together because it just feels like you've decided to go for a third Asian culture and you're, these people on the other continent are weird. Yeah, the alien culture thing, again, like I previously said in an episode like Shapes and Fresh Bones, makes me feel a bit gross. It's probably the kind of thing I wouldn't have thought about when I saw this as a teenager, but now feels really awkward on rewatching. Yeah. But beyond that, it's an average episode, but it's not boring. No, it's it's not boring. It's... Just, I do actually like the scenes in the lottery as well because they're so tense when you, before you know it's all fixed and you're wondering how this horrible draw is going to go. Yeah, and it's the simultaneous... I do kind of like how Sin is portrayed. The simultaneous regret he's not won or when he's won, the then mounting horror of doing the next draw is quite good. The whole, you, want, you want to win, but you want to win both stages. You've not just one than the other. And it's that kind of fatalism when he wins the first draw and then loses the second one. I think as well realising the fact that it exposits in the book again, but Kim doesn't have a mother. Her mother's passed away previously. So if Sin dies without making this money for her surgery, Kim's going to die too. 
I mean, we can extrapolate the mother's dead just because she's not around. I did feel that was a bit too convenient at the end as well. I mean, it's nice that she is going to go onto the organ donor list, so she's going to be fine. On the other hand, she's not coming back. <laughs> that, she get, that she's going to live at the end of this episode is lovely for the character, but in terms of the audience, she's irrelevant now. You assume she's going to live. You know, a horrifying know, yeah. number of people die on waiting lists. That's true, but the implication is that she's going to be okay. It's even weirder in the book because when Scully meets her for the first time and observes the fact that her leukemia is treatable, Scully then suddenly has this thought about, oh God, the American healthcare system, where the <laughs> book you know, explains to the teen reader the fact of how American healthcare is not the same as UK healthcare, for example, how expensive these surgeries are and how she's probably going to die before she can raise enough money or if she turns out to be an illegal immigrant, she'll never get insurance. Exactly. So on that basis, when Scully just offhandedly says, oh yeah, she's on the organ donor list at the end, it's, how? <laughs> oh, we pulled a few strings, we decided we're not going to mention Detective Charles' kind of indiscretions. I wonder if that's it. It's on the basis of the kind of police force corruption and stuff that they've managed to wing this in some way as compensation. It could be. I mean, that's probably the neatest way of looking at it. Talk of Detective Chow, it's a really weird point to pick out, but there's that tremendously strange continuity error near the end of the episode where they're staking out, well, there's a few actually, but they're staking out the place the lottery is held, which is a restaurant, I think, downstairs. Mm. So we see Detective Chow walk up to the door while they're watching it. And he pulls it open and walks in. Minutes later, Morton and Scully walk up to the door, have to force the lock, <laughs> and then go inside while the lottery is happening above them. And it's dead silent downstairs until the jar's knocked over, in which case they can hear the commotion. This really bothers you, doesn't it? I don't know if it really bothers me. It's a case of what on earth is going on. I mean, this is also a Chinese restaurant where they're doing um, surgery upstairs, apparently. They're multitasking. They're multitasking. And putting live frogs into people for reasons. I'm more concerned about the hygiene of the kitchen that has eyeballs behind the noodles, apparently. Yeah, and just buckets of ice. Which I, and also take like takeaway containers. It's, I'm sure organs are meant to be. They, you get those cases to transport organs, and you see them in film. Yeah. Use those, <laughs> or transport it to another person immediately. One of these things. Do you have anything else for hell money? No, I don't really have much more. It, it's kind of, it's a weird episode because there are aspects about it I really like, and there's some really fantastic actors in here. Because James Hong's terrifying, Sin and Kim are both really sympathetic characters, even kind of like B.D. Wong, even though he does feel a bit awkward in places. I would say, I, w I want to like B.D. Wong a lot more than I do in this, but I think that might be because I've seen him do better elsewhere. He feels really bland on reflection. I want to like him more than I, than I actually do. But I think you either made the point or alluded to it, a great point about James Hong is, James Hong is a tremendous actor anyway. But he is, if you need to recast Cigarette Smoking Man, you can please cast James Hung instead, because he's got that air of menace. Especially in the ending interrogation where he knows he's not going to get charged. And he's just smoking in this case of, this. if you couldn't have got William B. Davis, cast James Hong for this, he would have been amazing. He's always good in everything you see, James Hong. He makes a really great hero and a really scary villain. Yeah, I think, actually, though, where he wouldn't have worked as well is I don't think he would be able to do fear in the same way that William B. Davis is doing. I think James Hong is much more commanding, assured feel to him, whereas William B. Davis is great at portraying that, but then there's a bit where the mask slips and he gets frightened. Yeah. And I'm not sure James Hong would be the same for that. But put James Hong into the syndicate. Come on, it'd be great in one of those scenes. He'd be perfect just in that smoking room with the well known kid man and first elder. Exactly. <laughs> Great. Wasted him in Hellmoney, really. As much as he's, he's uh, sort of notable, because it's always nice to see James Hong in things. Yeah, I think my biggest issue with Chow, especially when he gives his lengthy speak about how terrible his uh, situation is as American-born Chinese, is the fact that this script is wit written by a white man. <laughs> yes. So it's the white man's impression of what life must be like for an American-born Chinese person. If the script had been written by a Chinese person, I'm sure it would be a lot more introspective. Yeah, and probably a bit more true to how these situations would be, what the struggles you actually face would be. Because 
as much as Chow says, you know, they all climb up, he's not having problems at first until he actually makes that speech. We know he's got his like nice little two story townhouse, for example. Yeah. So like, he's not suffering like sinners. No, but it's like when he goes when they go to the medicine shop, the woman behind the counter is talking to him completely openly and completely without any kind of scruples. He's not looking at him warily because he's a piece of. Mm. It's it, this hasn't happened in the episode. In part, I guess you've got to assume it's a front is he wants Mulder and Scully to believe that they won't speak to him because it's helping him do his cover up. Yeah, do his cover. <laughs> No. Oh, it's a frustrating episode. But yeah, it's a shame. It it doesn't feel like an X Files episode. It feels like a CSI episode. I don't think Mulder and Scully are at their best in here. But at the same time, it just has some neat set pieces. I can't get past how tense the lottery scene is, which is by far the best bits of this episode are the lottery scenes. I I can go with that. So I think in short, go back and rewrite it. <laughs> Turn it into an X Files episode. Give me real ghosts. Yeah, and not just people in masks who frighten more times than who frighten white people more times than they frighten Chinese people. I always say I don't want to rewrite the episodes and then rewrite the episodes, but it's even make us believe that these are just enforcers, and then do something at the last minute to realize that you know nobody has sent these people or yeah. something like that, or escape from a sealed room kind of thing. Yeah, you know they've gone around a blind corner and they've gone. Something like that. Shall we move on to something else? Something a little more fun, I Something feel. a little more fun. Okay. Our second episode this week is Jose Chung's From Outer Space, which, when you related it back when I was in school, this was always a problem because you, you got to express, no, no, it's not Jose Chung is from outer space. It's Jose Chung quotes from outer space. But anyway, directed by Rob Bowman, written by Darren Morgan, and first broadcast on the 12th of April, 1996. Guest stars Charles Nelson Riley as Jose Chung was in Cannonball Run 2 and All Dogs Go to Heaven and most of the rest of Don Bluth's work, bizarrely. Yeah, I think he's a voice in things like Rockadoodle and Troll in Central Park. Yep. He will show up in Millennium reprising the role one more time. And just for you, because I thought this was great, he's in SpongeBob SquarePants oh. as Dirty Bubble. Oh, the baddie. The yes. baddie. Uh, we also have William Lucking as Rocky Crickinson, who has been in Star Trek Deep Space Nine and Enterprise. He was also in Red Dragon. Who's he in Red Dragon? I think he's the sheriff. Okay, yeah. Daniel Quinn as Jack Schaefer was in Scanners the Showdown. Oh, wow. <laughs> yep. But um, the, the, the main guest, the other two main guest stars, Jesse Ventura, former pro wrestler, former politician. Although this is actually after the wrestling and before the politician, as far as I'm aware. Most famously probably is Predator. Yeah. Where he was Blaine. Uh, he was also in The Running Man uh, as himself in Repossessed. Okay, yeah. He's in Demolition Man. And it, sadly, he was in Batman and Robin. Oh. <laughs> but the, the other guest star, and uh, we'll have to talk about more later, is um, Alex Trebek. Alex Trebek, the game show host. The game show host. It's, if you look at his, his Wikipedia page, he actually has a huge filmography. Mm. But then you reach one of them, and it's as himself co-host of Jeopardy. <laughs> so he's been in a ton of things like Predator 2. He's been in Cheers. He's been in Groundhog Day. He's been in Friends. As Alex Trebek, host of Jeopardy. Connecting all the way back around to David Duchovny's infamous <laughs> video on Jeopardy. <laughs> Poor man. Okay. Jose Chung's from Outer Space. After a date, two teenagers, Harold and Chrissy, encounter a bright light and encounter two grey aliens. While the aliens are dragging the teens away from their car, another UFO arrives and beams down a red monster. In the aftermath, Harold insists he and Chrissy were abducted by aliens to the disbelief of the foul-mouthed detective Manners. But when Mulder has Chrissy hypnotised, she provides a different story of the abduction to Harold. Subsequently, Chrissy is rehypnotized and reveals that post abduction, she was taken to an Air Force base and forced to forget the events she experienced. The couple don't remain together. Chrissy takes up environmental activism, while Harold never lets go of his adoration of Chrissy and remains alone. Wait, wait, wait. That's not how I remember it. What do you think happens? Well, after investigating failed power lines, 
Rocky arrived at the scene of Harold and Chrissy's abduction just in time to see the red alien swiping at two grey aliens. Rocky soon succumbs to some debilitating effect and is dressed by the red alien, who reveals himself to be Lord Kinboat. He guides Rocky inside the Earth and reveals the vital secrets for humanity. Afterwards, Rocky transcribes his experience in screenplay format, but encounters a pair of men in black who threaten his life if he passed on any details of his encounter to other people. Rocky persists and hands his screenplay account to Mulder, who uses it as a reason to rehypnotize Chrissy. Rocky then leaves town to become a motivational guru based on his experiences. That's not how I remember it. Go on then, how do you remember it? Jose Chung, the title character, is a best-selling novelist who wants to write the first non-fiction science fiction story, and thus interviews Scully looking for her version of events surrounding the abduction of the team. Scully offers her largest sceptical side of the story and relates how, during their investigation, they conduct an autopsy on a dead alien who is revealed to be a pilot in an alien costume. Video footage of this autopsy, made by Blaine, who found the alien body, is released as a video hosted by the stupendous Yappy, much to Scully's embarrassment. Mulder encounters the other pilot of the UFO and attempts to get answers about the nature of the government, UFOs, and alien abductions, but fails to get solid answers before he is taken away by the Air Force. Mulder's account of this encounter is contradicted by Jose Chung's friend, who runs the diner Mulder was in. The man insists all Mulder did was order sweet potato pie and ask strange alien-related questions. Afterward, Mulder encounters the men in black, who are vaguely menacing before the less vocal of the pair, who resembles Alex Trebek, hypnotizes Mulder. Next morning, Mulder and Scully are called to a classified plane crash where the dead bodies of both pilots are carried away. Scully apologizes to Chung regarding the lack of conclusion. While writing, Chung is visited by Mulder, who asks him not to publish the book because it will make all those involved look very silly. Chung publishes the book regardless. To her disappointment, Scully is deemed a noble of spirit but merely a federal employee. Mulder is described as a ticking time bomb of insanity, and Blaine takes over Rocky's old job. This was always an infamous episode for me, mostly because it's one of a handful I missed the first time round. Uh, as I've said before, I started <laughs> watching in season five, so it was quite a while before I saw this one. Yeah, but it was really annoying because everyone... Here's the weird thing about Jose Chung's from Outer Space, is you can't actually spoil the episode, because whatever you say about it won't really make sense out of context. So my friends at school were talking about it excitedly the next morning, and nothing they said to me made any sense at all. Jose Chung was extremely possible at the time because there's a magazine advert that came out like a month or two later, and you could buy the grey alien smoking in the cage <laughs> as like a little neat. set piece. And I was looking at it going, what? How? Why does this make sense? And my friends were going about the smoking alien and how funny it was. Because why was the alien smoking? What the hell's going on? And so yeah, and then it took me a lot, a, a very long time to actually get hold of the episode and finally watch it and understand why this was. To actually, no. To be fair, I watched like the last thirty seconds by accident because I'd forgotten the Exorcist was on. Switched over to part of Jose Chung's final monologue. In this case of, I don't know what I just watched. <laughs> Who are you people? What's going on? Anyway, this is this is my uh, always my contender for the best episode of the X Files, which I know you go for um, Clyde Brookman. Clyde Brookman said, but it's just, this one has so much going on. Yeah, it's we lampooned it a bit there in the opening, but it really is a Rashomon style story. Yes. Uh, there's an interesting essay about this on in the AV Club, the Union's um, uh, kind of review spin-off thing, where basically, and I don't think we've actually run into these in stuff we've watched, but the Rashomon episode used to be a popular sitcom thing. Okay. But what most things do for the Rashomon-style episode, which we'll, we'll get into what Rashomon was in a second, is you have basically you split the episode in three. Yeah. So you have viewpoint one, you have viewpoint two, then you have viewpoint three, and viewpoint three is always the truth, whereas viewpoints one and two are mis uh, misguided impressions of what actually happened. I see. Whereas, if you'd like to go to what Rashomon actually is, uh, Rashomon was a Japanese novel by Rinosuke Akutagawa. Uh, more famously, it was a film in the nineteen fifties by the legend Akira Kurosawa. Uh, arguably, Rashomon's my favorite of his films, but 
it's often overlooked because it's not an action-packed samurai film like The Seven Samurai or Kagemusa. The basic idea of Rashomon is it all takes place as a group of people are sheltering from the rain and they discover a samurai has been murdered nearby. And it's all conflicting accounts of what the events were actually leading to the samurai's murder, which by the end of the film, you have a pretty clear idea of what happened, but it's still, there are some vagaries there, you know, because nobody's stories match up to spoil a 70 year old film, basically because his death was somewhat kind of embarrassing and dishonorable. So therefore no one involved really want to admit to how embarrassing the sequence of events really was. Yeah. And I have actually I've seen Wash Ramon, we watched it together, and it was uh it's it is a good film. My favorite part really is where they get a spirit medium in to get the ghost of the dead samurai in to explain what happened. And that version of events contradicts the other two. I think that's the spirit medium in Rashomon made me think of the hypnosis sequences in this episode, yeah. to be honest. Uh, and of course, it, Rashomon leads to the really highbrow Simpsons gag. Homie, you liked Rashomon. Well, that's not how I remember it. <laughs> it's just fantastic, really. It's the kind of ongoing refrain in Rashomon is someone will give their account and then someone else will say something to the effect of, wait, that's not how I remember it, and then give their own account. There's maybe four or five different accounts by the end of the film. Yeah. Jose Chung has got some repeated phrasing as well, much like that, though ours, uh, in this case, are, you're a dead man, or you're feeling very sleepy, very relaxed. It's interesting as well, though, sort of, <laughs> to start with the more sort of technical stuff, is this has been nominated as Darren Morgan's most vindictive jab at Mulder ever i don't think he's ever quite this aggressive towards him ever again true and it's like taking down every one of Mulder's sacred cows in one go because this is the first time the exiles has ever pushed back on hypnosis saying we don't know what we're dealing with this doesn't actually help or there's a very good chance this is actively hindering the investigation because if you've never seen jose chung i mean i would sort of strongly suggest you see it because it's absolutely tremendous 45 minutes of tv but there's re a repeated trickery that it does where they have hypnosis sequences uh, to try and get at what happened and there's very intentionally what they think happened initially is then altered by the hypnosis a second time but each hypnosis sequence is always framed the same way but substitutes the people in the frame so you have the same number of people in the frame in the same positions but in the first time it's the people in the room doing the hypnosis which includes more than scully then they switched out for aliens, who are exactly the same postures, holding the same objects. And then it's Air Force personnel, and it's the same again. And there's a great sense of unreliable narrators, because no one can agree what happened that night. Even though it's reasonably safe to assume that the initial sequence of events has to have happened, isn't it? The, the Air Force pilots have to have been faking an alien abduction, and then Lord Kinbot arrived. <laughs> There is definitely that third <laughs> alien. Lord Kim Kimbo's incredible as well. Uh, again, you have to see the episode to appreciate him is essentially the actor in this really, really dodgy looking monster costume has been filmed at high speed and then slowed down. So he moves looking a lot like a Ray Harryhausen stop motion creature. But then also talks like he's from the 1800s. Be thou not afraid, Rocky. Yeah. Come, I will show thee. Showeth. Showeth. <laughs> and, oh, it can never quite get over when Mulder's reading the transcript. Because he would soon tell me it was Lord Kinvolt. <laughs> Just the moment of embarrassment. Sorry, I should not, try not to laugh too much, but... There are tons of really, really nice cinematic references in this episode as well. It's not just um, Lord Kimbolt's tribute to Ray Harryhausen. There are loads of references to things like Space Above and Beyond. Um, there's a couple to Close Encounters of the Third Kind in there. Yep. There's the obvious uh, Star Destroyer at the very start of the episode. Oh, with the cherry picker. Yeah, and Blaine has a Lenin Falcon hanging in his bedroom. Yeah, I, I also like the fact he's got Mulder's I Want to Believe poster, but he's crossed out all the words so it just says I believe. <laughs> The more uh, strong um, minded than Mulder. I also, there's just, there's just so many little bits and pieces because I like that Mulder has refused to talk to Jose Chung at the start. Just will not talk to him. And presumably because you're going to ask, ask some very awkward questions about what happened out there. 
and no one has a good answer. And that Mulder doesn't want the book published because it'll make everyone look silly. And yes, Mulder, it will. Because <laughs> it's inherently a ludicrous um, situation. But we've also got other, other weird um, stuff happening in the episode, like Detective Manners' censorship. Oh, where everything's bleeped out. Except not bleeped out. It's just, they're literally having saying bleepy blank. There's one too blank beepers. Yeah. Want to go talk to this blank hole? Played, of course, by Larry Musser, a ongoing uh, guest star in the X-Files. He often plays sheriffs and other people of high rank like that. He's, he's very good. I mean, he, he's great in this episode as well, though. He's just... He's actually... He gets into it, though. Alex. He's actually quite involved when he gets to the alien autopsy. Which... which so I jumped to the alien autopsies. It just You don't expect this from the X-Files. With the whole Blaine wandering around the woods looking for UFOs, trips over an alien body, calls up the police, who then bring the men in black, who is Morden Scully who then threatens Blaine, and Scully sort of objects to that. Then he let him film the autopsy, which gets presented as a videotape by the stupendous Yappy. In the style of those fact or fiction sort of ones from the 90s. Yeah. I just love Scully's embarrassment. That, you know, oh, so this is actual footage of your autopsy. Oh, God. It's also the fact that it's cut footage because they miss the bit where she discovers the zipper and proves it's actually a human. Yeah. And I like your point as well, though, of it really it says a lot about priorities that blaine gets uncomfortable when it's revealed to be a dead person not a dead alien and he kind of just flees at that point mm. the one of the other things this is the first episode to do get, get back to Mulder's other sacred cows but this is the first episode to really engage with the men in black idea because we've had men in black as government agents before this is the more supernatural men in black for the first time yeah um uh previous what we've assumed to be men in black are more the shady operatives in the black sedans that pull up and try and yeah. shoot everyone whereas these these ones are uh, not sure what they're doing but we love them you're playing into those real world accounts well i say real world depending on how far you take this of the idea that after and uh, someone reports an alien sighting men appear in their house and act in such an erratic way that even if people try to recount these encounters, it just makes them sound crazy. Yeah, and I, I like the the shop talk when Morton runs into them because of uh, oh, they, they purposely act in weird ways to to make discredit witnesses. I see no reason why any witness would find this distracting. Jesse Ventura's presence as the kind of talkative man in black is just incredible as well. He like every actor in this episode, he just goes all in. He he definitely understands the assignment, and it's. It's from their introduction, though, just driving straight into Rocky's garage. And start with, no object in the night sky has been misidentified more often than the planet Venus. That's when I knew something was weird. Which part? <laughs> and then you've got, you've got like, the gag that falls on from that, where you never see the second man in black clearly. But everyone always looks happy to see him. Yeah, everyone smiles at him. And then just... And I love the, the inconsistency with him in black, because they, they sort of vaguely threaten to Rocky but leave him alone and leave his transcript alone. But they'll do a pile drive for Ron Blaine, just wrestling a move out of nowhere for some reason to steal the tape. And then I'm not sure what he's doing in Scully's, in Scully's motel room. And then we just lead up to that the, the gag that everyone remembers. Alex Trebek? Well, Mota didn't say he was Alex Trebek. He just looked like it. As the fun fact is that as a wrestling fan, Darren Morgan always wrote the Jesse Ventura part for Jesse Ventura. But... The Alex Trebek part, they originally considered Johnny Cash. I can see that working too. But I think there's something... I don't know, the Johnny Trebek thing just feels a bit more surreal, doesn't it? Just the way that Jose Chung says, Alex Trebek, the game show host? Again, it's feeding into this idea that recounting this just makes you sound crazy. <laughs> exactly. And then just the fact that Alex Trebek hypnotises Walter. I don't remember letting you in last night, Walter. They were already here. Bizarrely for Darren Morgan, that's a great bit of fan service for the fans as well. The first time Morgan and Scully share a room. I, know, I was going to say, it, as much as they seem at odds at first, that they actually are sort of, you know, you've got this in the Jose Chung making sort of um, suggestive eyebrow motions at this. Oh. <laughs> He's very into it. I mean, um, there are reports that Charles Nelson Riley was tremendously... Um, good on set learned like literally everyone's names on set 
Yeah, I read that. Like, every member of the cast and crew. Yeah, on first name terms with literally everybody involved. I think it's the counterpart to the... I've forgotten the actor's name who played Clyde Brookman. Peter Boyle, I think. Who apparently was somewhat difficult and much like you imagine the character of Clyde Brookman to actually be. Yeah. Uh, oh, I do remember the motivation for this episode, which is really strange, which is basically Darren Morgan was attending a casting session where someone was doing a Truman Capote impersonation and he decided wondered what Truman Capote would be like in the X-Files. and Oh, so Jose Chung was supposed to be Truman Capote. Yeah. I mean, admittedly, I don't know much about Truman Capote per se other than legendary parties in Breakfast at Tiffany's. Mm. Kind of curious to find out now, but that was the inspiration for all this. I admit I would like to know more about Truman Capote too. In my head, he's kind of a Kilgore Trout kind of figure. Yeah, well, it's based on Jose Chung at least. Yes, mm. he must be. There's interesting implication in this episode and uh, one that weirdly picks up a thread that nisai introduced or 71 introduced and piper maru and apocrypha just basically said we're not gonna do anything with it which was nisai and 71 really sort of try to hammer home that there's no aliens involved in alien abduction it's a illegal experiments being done on this railroad and then Jose Chung bizarrely connects into Deep Throat because we've got the Impossible Flying Craft where after you've flown it, sex feels trite apparently, who are taking people back to an Air Force base and then letting hypnotists convince them they've been abducted by aliens. So they've walked into an ordinary room with ordinary people and come out screaming they've been abducted by aliens. And Maud is really sort of not coping well with this, sort of say, but it can't all be like that. Because unfortunately... Other than Lord Kinbolt, and no one wants to talk about Lord Kinbolt because you can't talk about Lord Kinbolt. But the implications of the episode are Lord Kinbolt's real as well. Yeah, because given that Jack Schaefer just casually says, oh, what, Lord Kinbolt? Yeah, it's <laughs> like away. three different characters that verify Lord Kinbolt's involvement. So, yeah, take aim at Mulder's sacred cow there, and also the fact that this encounter with the pilot might not have happened. It depends how trustworthy the cook is versus Mulder, given. The cook does not remember this conversation or Jack Schaefer happening. You don't know if the men in the bike got to the cook. We don't. <laughs> Given their attitude to everything else, God knows what could have happened there. I do love, and for however you think it came about it, the idea that the cook's testimony is real, though, and Mulder is just, has had a psychotic break, apparently, is they're eating sweet potato pie, uh, asking multiple questions, which I actually wrote down. <laughs> oh, you got the question. Yeah. Mulder's just sat there ordering slice after slice of sweet potato pie and each pie evokes him to ask his questions. So we've got, have you ever seen a UFO? Have you ever experienced missing time? Have you ever been abducted by aliens? Have you ever found a metal implant in your body? Have you checked everywhere? It's impossible to not believe he could have actually gone and done this. It's Mulder's been on a brink of a psychotic break through the entire series and particularly any time he's had to give testimony in court. So this <laughs> doesn't feel like a stretch to me. No, he is very bad when you put him on the stand like that. But it's quintessential X-Files as well, because it's kind of condensing the feel of the entire conspiracy so far into one episode, where nothing seems to slot together and ultimately nothing makes sense. There are so many big gaping holes that you can't explain. No, and we have to, we have to take Lord Kimball was actually there and how much of the abduction on the ship actually happened is negligible and being through the air and through the air and it's really difficult as well to get across the consistent visual trickery they do so it's not just things like the framing of the hypnosis shots it's things like afterwards harold's got those three vents cut into his shirt mm. And when Jack Schaefer shows up, he's got three um, scratches in his chest in the same place. Yeah. I guess inferring it's Lord Kimbolt's kind of... Claws. Clawed hands, <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, given the impression that he was... It, it comes back to your cockroach thing as well, though, where Harold felt he was the bug, being, having the wings pull off of him. Yeah, true. You also have the interesting... You touched on it there about the juxtaposition of the imagery and the hypnosis sequences and stuff. It's the fact that... All of the testimonies are really cleverly structured, so they all have seeds of the previous testimony in them. Yeah. Which helps kind of get this illusion across of 
we're seeing bits of the elephant, we're not seeing the whole thing. Yes. And but also Scully's point after the second Chrissy hypnotized the second time is I think you and the hypnotist was leading her. So pushing her into the conclusions they wanted to hear back. And there's an interesting point by Jose Chung, which I imagine must be kind of an authorial insert, of hypnosis is really strange when you get down to it and how it works no one quite understands. And that's just weird that it does. Yeah, it's one of those weird, irrefutable truths is hypnosis does actually work. Yeah. It is a form of medicine. But whether you can actually do this memory recall that is pervading the X-Files and hypno UFO cases is... Even the X-Files keeps commenting because Mulder is obsessed with the recession hypnosis yeah. and it's been brought up time and time again about how unreliable it is. Yeah, though I think this is the time they've pushed back the hardest because I think it came up in Born Again was one of them where Scully was extremely dubious about it. With the little girl. Yeah. I think this is one where they've it's actually been put to him that, no, you are messing with things as we go. Also, Mulder, you decided to rehypnotize Chrissy on the basis of the of Rocky's transcript of what happened. And it, it's still that glorious joke, isn't there? I don't know what was more offensive. The uh, depictions of the inner Earth sex orgy, or the fact it was formatted in screenplay format. You get more of the lunacy with Rocky's final testimony where you see him preaching to his little cult where he's talking about um, achieving enlightenment if it's at the Earth's core so long as you avoid the lava men or whatever yeah. it is. So whatever he experienced that night has done something quite different to him to what it did to Harold and Chrissy. I think it's canon. Lord Kimbo was there. Yeah. So therefore the subterranean sex orgies and the lava men, <laughs> also fact. And the fact that he just leaves town, it's like, how do I get, how do I get hold of you? Oh, you won't. And also the fact that his response to when he, the Lemon in Black vaguely threatened him is, I'm a Republican. <laughs> what? I imagine that's in response to the real world account where Jimmy Carter saw the UFO. You know, it was, uh, in fact, I think they debunked it later as he claimed publicly to have seen a UFO and later recanted saying it was the planet Venus. Yeah. Actually, I think that's what the Men in Black says, isn't it? He, he refers to him in a weird convoluted way, but I think he's talking about President Carter. Hmm. I must admit, I can't remember whether President Carter's a Republican or a Democrat because I'm English and no, I, I never know. know. But I'm presuming on that basis he's a Democrat. Yeah. The other thing about the Men in Black in this one is it doesn't predate Men in Black, the franchise as a whole, because the comics already exist at this point, but it's well before the it's at least a year before the first film came out. And you've got to wonder, the opening scene in Men in Black has that bit where they're getting the illegal immigrants and they've got... There's one alien amongst them. They've got, yeah. and he says, "Oh, you just witnessed um, the planet Venus um, refracted through some swamp gas." You gotta wonder if they watch the X Files and say, "Ah, planet Venus, we've got to use that as an excuse." Is that a nod to um, Jose Chung or not? Or again, the Jimmy Carter. Or Jimmy Carter, yeah. I always do love Jose Chung. Sum up though, just you know, Scully for all her fangirling over him is just a federal employee, or Diana Dian Less. Diana Lisky and Rainyard Muldrake. The ticking time bomb of insanity. But I, I love how strange Mulder's made to look, though, when he actually finally meets Jose Chung at the end. When he's going on about the publisher and how the publisher is connected to the military industrial entertainment complex. And it's, wow, Mulder, you're actually insane. <laughs> this is gibberish. I think Darren Morgan deeply understands Mulder, to be honest. Yeah, and has not a lot of patience for him because it again it's going rocky's testimony Mulder's reading this and scully correctly says he's nuts Mulder, you're nuts and Mulder gets chrissy re-hypnotized on the basis of the screenplay format Mulder, what are you doing the first part corroborates yes what about the last part it's we have just a slew of witnesses through this episode which are the people that you would write off as being unreliable because you've got the two teenagers who are desperately trying to hide the fact that they're having underage sex. Yep. We have Rocky with his delusions of grandeur, writing up his manifest in screenplay format to form his own cult. Over 48 hours as well. And you've got Blaine, who admittedly gets a job at the end of the episode, but is basically a neat who is so obsessed by UFOs that he dreams of being abducted and taken away from Earth himself. So he doesn't have to get a job. So he doesn't have to get a job. <laughs> yep, correct is these are all characters that we completely write off their testimony, 
you know, if you read these descriptions of these people anywhere next to an account of people who had encountered a UFO, you'd think, no way. Yes. I mean, that's the obvious counter to Raw the Copper Pages, which I think is another way of looking at it. Because one of Mordor's points in early on is that the witnesses are all scientific people, you know, trust, allegedly trustworthy witnesses mm. who succumb to the mass hysteria just like everyone else. So this is the flip side of it. This is showing that, yeah, if you give these people as witnesses, are just as reliable. These are kind of those stories that you used to see at supermarket checkouts, the kind of seedy looking newspaper with the grey alien on the cover sort of thing. They're those kind of testimonies. Yeah, and uh, Jose Chung also makes the good point of um, every time anyone's got a story like this, they say, I know this sounds crazy, but... And everyone uses that phrase all the way through the episode. You have reminded me, though, because I used to buy UFO magazines when I was much when I was a teenager, because, it, you know, that's the kind of thing you're interested in as a teenager. Couldn't get the 14 Times at the time, but could get these other weird UFO magazines. And there's one that I always remember for, you know, do you say in the future that it's been 30 years on? I don't think it's going to happen. And but the, the, part, the thrust of this article was, we're coming towards the latter stage of the aliens' plan for us with all these abductions. And they're going to start moving on their next project. Okay. And the, the next few years are going to be very dark for us. And don't think that panned out, guys. Because of Mulder's involvement. So I don't think they really exist anymore. Well, I imagine that basically they would have been jumping on the bandwagon of the X-Files at this point in time when the X-Files was in ascendant. And now we have the internet. And now we have the internet, so all the crack points are online. <laughs> and... And modern conspiracy theories aren't fun, it must be said. Modern conspiracy theories are actually kind of terrifying. True. And the people who believe in them are even scarier. So this is not... 90s conspiracy corner was a lot more fun. And yeah. was outlandish, weird sci-fi nonsense. Yeah, I guess we've kind of moved on to things like QAnon from believing in the Nessie. Yeah, and... We don't really want to go there, and the flat earthers and all the rest of it, and somehow that's now a thing again, which is just... Yeah, you're right. I'd like to go back to when conspiracies were fun and harmless. Exactly. Do we have much else for Jose Chung? Other than we will see him again in Millennium, when whenever we get to Millennium, because this is like one of the major reasons we want to watch Millennium, is his other appearance. Which I believe is called something like Jose Chung's Doomsday Defence? That's the one. Yeah, I've never seen it, but... I'm excited. Yes. I mean, it's just, it's the same. It, it's Charles Nelson Riley again. Sadly, he's passed away, so we can't ever do it again, like the revival, if there's another revival series or anything. I think you'd be hard pressed to recast him as well. Yeah, you're not going to. Uh, yeah, he is Jose. He is or was Jose Chung, and that's. Maybe that's the thing you haven't got across is how funny he is as a character. Yeah, it's like he's just a, got a, so much bund a bundle of hicks and it's sort of the personable, but also how. He's very obviously judging people like Blaine and Mulder, just in how he's acting with them. It's kind of interesting because unlike previous memorable characters like Clyde Brookman, like Pusher, we don't learn anything about Jose Chung as a person. No. It's entirely the persona that you kind of mm. grow to like through the episode. He's a, he's a very likeable author who is uh, purely in it for the money. And is very honest about that yeah. as well. <laughs> in one word, money. But it's not just that he's a author who's writing these sensationalist stories for the money. Is he's very, very charismatic, very talkative, very personable, and witty. Yes. Yeah. It in some ways it's almost a shame he's actually not in the episode more. Because it, it's it's always nice to go out to the little sides with him and Scully and just see them talking to each other. <laughs> and I also do always like and um, the very sort of cutting one about the X Files. Because this would be, except for Quagmire, which isn't technically his, this is Darren Morgan's last X-Files episode until the revival. Oh, really? Yeah. So he, this is where he stopped, because he couldn't, he couldn't cope with the pace anymore. Oh, what a pity. It is. But it's the sum up, though, at the end, though, when Scully says, I'm, I know it doesn't have the conclusion you're looking for, but it's got more than most of our cases. True. As a, as a jab against the X-Files as a whole of, yeah, how are you two getting away with this? Because these are the worst sum-ups ever. I think it's extrapolated somewhere. Mulder says it in one episode that they actually have a higher success rate than the FBI's average. Yeah, that's sort of 
But then the X-Files seems to have a terrible success rate. So what on earth is going on over there? In a slightly more serious bent, there is, at the core of Jose Chung, a kind of deeply tragic, sad story as well, which is Harold, who gets lost in the shuffle. But basically, he has, he's got a relationship with Chrissy and consent, consensual sexual intercourse was had that night, which has led to her trauma response, which is partly confusing every matter in Twilight. But basically, he gets shuffled out of the plot really early on and then he comes back in at the tail end when Chrissy has no interest in him anymore because she's all about saving the planet. It's also kind of sad in a way and it's kind of dark is that early in the episode, Chrissy when she's confused and being somewhat misled by all the hypnosis attempts, accuses him of rape. Yes. And it's very quickly rectified and they very quickly figure out that it's a consensual relationship, so there's no lasting damage. But it's probably the one dark edge of it is that you don't focus on Harold more on that basis. Yes, and I suppose the, the other troubling one, and yeah, actually a bad thing about the episode, is Mulder using prison rape as a really flippant threat. Like said, that's really bad, Mulder. Yeah, what that's true. Doing? It's just one throwaway comment towards mm, the start. But it, it's, a, it's a nuisance wrinkle in the episode. I guess it's the whole unreliable narratives as you can't be sure Mulder actually said that and it does feel out of character. It does. I mean, that could be Scully sort of punching up or sort of summarising a more vague point he made or something. Yeah. Since we're getting it via Scully. And uh, the other thing to take away from in this more serious terms is... It's a demonstration of the unreliability of eyewitnesses because people put so much stock into eyewitnesses mm. and they're notoriously unreliable. I think you've mentioned it before about if they ask you to describe someone as you wouldn't even remember their hair colour. Yeah, the, the photo fit things in these procedural shows, I don't understand how you do them because I just, you'd ask me and I'd say he had eyes, he was wearing glasses and he might have had a mouth. Anywhere between four and six feet tall. Yeah, I'm lousy with um, heights and weights. And accents, no idea. But it's one of the central points about Jose Chung, once you get past the comedy aspect, is the it's in direct contrast, weirdly, to the blessing way. Because Alfred Holstein says, memory like fire is radiant and immutable. Mm. Jose Chung says, memory is absolutely fallible. You can destroy it and screw it up in so many ways while trying to get at what the truth of it. And trying to do so, you can actually damage that memory further and cause just confabulation. Which is exactly what we see in Chrissy. Exactly. So, yeah, the serious aspects of the episode are more than, I think it's really an early indication that Mulder's search for the truth can't end in a way he's going to want it to. It's maybe Mulder seeing things through the rose tinted glasses in the fact that we've said a few times, though, well, a lot of writers seem to forget about it, is Mulder's got an eidetic memory. Yes. And maybe the assumption that everyone else has a memory like Mulder. Yeah. So it's on that basis, though, then we then the episode introduces an interesting quandary there, because if Mulder's got an eidetic memory, we're meant to take the encounter with Colonel Schaefer at the diner and the men in black in Scully's hotel room as, as correct, contradicted by the cook at the diner who says Mulder didn't walk in with anyone, but the only witness we've got to the men in black is Mulder himself via Scully. And also in your counterpart of that is the fact that Scully doesn't remember any of this. No. Though could have been hypnotised by Alex Trebek. <laughs> Probably was hypnotised by Alex Trebek. To go back to poor Harold, though, the one thing I did like about his character, and I felt we could have lent into it a bit more, to be fair, but it's fun, is the fact that he and Chrissy, are, particularly for the 90s, their gender roles are kind of reversed. In the fact that Chrissy is the pragmatic one, and he's the one who, on their first date, immediately says how he's head over heels in love with her. You know, he betray he pe kind of presents like the teenage girl in a nineties thing. Yeah, but also I think it is also deliberately he's trying to be the protector role and says, I want anything happen to you, Chrissy, when they're been able to follow Kinbolt. And then the second the door flies open, he ducks out the way so she's dragged off to God knows what. Mm. So I've I've we've got to say earlier as well so, remember I said you could get the little statuette of the grey alien? Please say you could get Lord Kimbo. I don't think you could, unfortunately. Aww. But, it's finally watching the scene, though, it's making sense of when people said the grey alien's smoking. And you're going, really? Why was it doing that? And then you watch it, and it all makes sense because it's a guy in costume. He hasn't taken it off. 
but it's a great bit when Mulder interviews him and he says, um, uh, oh, what what was the Graylian doing? Oh, he he just kept saying the same thing over and over again. This is not, not happening. happening. This, this is not, not happening. Oh, was he talking in your mind? No, normally. <laughs> and then he was like, did his lips move? No. And it doesn't really make sense until they do the autopsy later yeah. and you realise it's a guy in a suit. But I think it's when you see it that you can see it's a guy in a suit. And did me a bit right to the start as well, though. One of the things that always drew me to Jose Chung, even though I hadn't watched it, was it's when you describe the premise, it's almost too good to sort of pass up. It's two teens are abducted by aliens. Midway through, it another alien turns up and ducks all of them. Because it's like the first two are actually Air Force pilots, and you're going, this is amazing, why have we done this before? Yeah. And just that breakdown of the reveals, because it's all done quite genuinely at first, though it seems to be a saucer ship that comes down, and the aliens approach the car, and you get them, them fainting and everything, that, that's really creepy. And then you get the, the bit where you're not sure where they're just dragging the bodies, and it's for, do they normally do that? And then the other UFO shows up, and then... The bit where it's transparently there are two people in suits talking to each other because you can see the lips not move right. Mm. Like, oh, what? how the hell should I know? The other repeated phrase, which we've got before. True, yeah. I think there's a comment that Darren Morgan had to walk Rob... Um, was it Rob? Yeah, Rob Bowman through the um, script like five times or something before you understood how to do it. I think the quote said it was... 15 times in an eight-hour meeting or something ridiculous. Yeah, and I, it paid off. Yeah. Because they, they were doing something, but I can imagine it's a complicated thing of, you've got to frame this shot of this office. Right, now do the same thing again, but they're grey aliens. Now do it again, but they're Air Force personnel. And this guy's got to be holding the mug in this shot, then the alien's got to be holding this weird container, and then this Air Force pilot's got to be holding a mug again. Just, yeah. It's just so... It's 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 a lot, but it, it's really good. It's hard to get across how good this really is, but I think the criticism of the time m- makes it quite clear that this is a special episode. I don't think anybody ever has said a bad thing about Hosey Chung's From Outer Space, and it frequently ranks high in like best episode listings, yeah. much like we said about Pusher last week. Yeah, you know, uh, Hosey Chung will always get into the top ten at the very least. They'll usually be hovering in the top five. And particularly from the early seasons, you often saw critics at the time calling it the best episode. I do know of a few bits of criticism for it. Okay. There's only a few. One, I can't remember who said these, but one of them was that the episode had been built up too much by the time someone watched it. So it had gained a reputation over the years. I see. And they were disappointed by the execution. That doesn't feel fair. It doesn't feel fair. And also, I'm not sure what more you were expecting from it, because that's a packed 45 minutes. Making to a two party, you could have really gone all out, but it's fine as it is. The other criticism, and this is a kind of a weird aesthetic one, came from the AV Club again. Their argument was uh, Jose Chung is an astonishing hour of TV. It's not actually a very good X Files episode. Okay. Uh, it's like they held up Clyde Brookman as an excellent X Files episode. Jose Chung is an excellent episode of just in general, but it's not actually indicative of the x-files as it were i suppose if you saw it first you'd have a really different idea of what the x-files is about yeah and i think it is that clyde brookman ties into the regular format better Mm. whereas jose chung is very much the case saying we are going to just blow open the structure and just give you multiple inconsistent parts of the story and you're not going to be able to put it together very easily (laughs) but you're going to have fun trying to make sense of this true so those are those are the, the criticisms. But in general, it's weathered it very well. I mean, it and Clyde Brockman are always held up as the high watermarks of the series, regardless. Yeah, they're certainly going to be difficult to beat in terms of the comedic episodes. In a shocking twist, though, I think we're going to ask you <laughs> to um, try and do Conspiracy Corner on this one, given <laughs> absolutely does involve the conspiracy. Kind of. At least it's deeply entwined with... If Deep Throat counted, this will count, I think. Bring it. Okay. So, unexpectedly, we'll go to... Kim's Conspiracy Corner. Okay. Following on from what we previously saw way back in Season 1 in Deep Throat, 
we have now clearer evidence that the government is indeed making their own experimental aircraft out of UFO technology. These are being piloted by humans, again, as we saw in Deep Throat. We have heard now firsthand from one of these pilots who apparently hasn't been driven mad. Maybe the technology has improved in the last few years, but he claims it's better than sex driving one of these things. Bizarrely, however, they do pilot them while dressed as grey aliens, which is not something we previously realised. We also see that they are using these UFOs to abduct people. It's not the aliens, it's the government, as I personally and most of Twitter, but not Nick, suspected from Ascension. So indeed, this could be the way Scully was taken too on that basis. We are tying back to that in the fact that we've got these people who work for the government pretending to be aliens, abducting people, taking them away where they're then hypnotised by the government who believe they have been abducted by aliens. The reasoning behind this is still somewhat unclear to us. However, for added complexity, we have learned from this episode that there is a deeper conspiracy at foot. It's not just the government. There are alien beings, but instead of space, they come from the Earth's molten core. We've got a kind of hollow Earth theory going on here now. Not only is it Lord Kinboat and presumably Lord Kinboat's race down there, but we also now have evidence through Rocky's screenplay account of the lava people and where our souls go after we die, down to the Earth's core, deeper and deeper in the hope that they will find reincarnation and enlightenment down there. Finally, we see that the government agents uh, stretch further than the men in black sedans we've seen previously, that there are true, in the truest sense, men in black at play who are in line with the government. This could explain somewhat, I feel, Mulder's differing accounts he's found. For example, back in Conduit, we had the woman who testified and then immediately changed her story when pressed. There's nothing to say that these kind of more supernatural men in black have got to her who often apparently take the form of people you may recognise, like Alex Trebek, the game show host. They exist to hypnotise people, to force them to change their stories, but otherwise act so weird that anybody who recounts these experiences will come across as crazy. We are also seen in the episode that the government will stop at no expense to hide their illicit goings-on, something that we've seen throughout the entire conspiracy so far. In the case of this episode, it takes the form of faking a plane crash and apparently killing off a healthy pilot just to hide the truth about their alien technology spacecrafts. Thank you. You have reminded me of two points there, which is the other dark part of Jose Chung is, yeah, we killed off Jack Schaefer. The military have just literally killed him to hide this. Which he says they will do if they get him. Yep. Uh, The other is I always, I do really like Jose Chung's reaction to the men in black of um, the black class fixers being a common folklore thing through the ages oh uh, yeah you're kind of imagining it in western folklore of something like a fuka yeah and that ties back into an observation i can't remember who made it of all aliens are in modern day fey they occupy exactly the same position of taking people away and doing things to them oh you've got your idea of like children being spirited away and maybe they'll come back years later yeah or just, you know, changelings in general and everything. Is, yeah, true. Or, so that's the, the other point that um, Jose Chung is making is that, yeah, Mulder, your beliefs are just a modern version of some very ancient stuff and they've got, but they hold about as much water as the fairies do. A good point. Mulder's not doing well. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna have to pull out some major conspiratorial stuff to counteract this one. I wonder if that'll be something that comes back in the X-Files later. It'd be interesting to see more of this kind of connection between aliens and perhaps the unseelie yeah folklore and just out out, outdated notions of the world i guess it's the whole you kind of still hear about alien abduction stories and stuff today people talk about banshee a lot less it is a shame there's no mock-up of the full book because it'd be fascinating to see what the rest of it actually looked like you can read a chunk of it in the video game yes If you sign up to our Patreon on a related note, um, there is the first part of our Let's Play. When's the second part coming, Nick? Very shortly. Very shortly. The second part will be very shortly. But you do see a bit in there where I find a copy of Jose Chung and do a bit of rifling through it. Yep. Find out which bits of the book actually made it into the game. 
it's not actually a surprise which bits of the book made of the game, but anyway, it was a nice Easter egg. But yeah, what's the link to the Patreon? Our Patreon is patreon.com slash things are getting strange. There are three levels that you can fund us at on there. They all give you slightly different perks, so it's worth a read through to decide which tier is for you. But all of them will give you access to our Let's Play, uh, which is currently the X-Files FMV game from the 90s. And there'll be other things to follow afterwards. The I think we're thinking of doing the other PlayStation game, aren't we? And yes. the comics and a few other things. Yep. Uh, and if you'd like to get a hold of us, our email address is thingsaregettingstrange42 at gmail.com. Alternatively, you can contact us on social media. We're on Tumblr and Twitter at GetStrange42. We're on Mastodon at GetStrange42 at Universodon.com. And you can also find us on Facebook by searching for Things Are Getting Strange and X-Files Rewatch Podcast. Next week, we have Avatar and Quagmire. Okay. I remember one of those episodes. Yeah, and it's the one with Queer Greg. Ah, uh, yes, we finally get the doggy's name. Yes. She's actually taken a bizarrely long time to get Yeah, there. I don't think they've named him so far. But look forward to that. Our theme music is Envisioned by Kevin MacLeod. You can find that on Incompetech.com, licensed under the Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0. Thank you all for listening, and until next week, remember... No, no object, object in the night sky has been misidentified, misidentified more often, often than as the planet, planet Venus. Venus.